Exactly. All right. Well, hello, everybody. Okay. <laughs> We're off to a great start. Hi, everyone. We're doing really good. <laughs> um, we all hang out way too much together, clearly. <laughs> uh, but, lately, um, but welcome to Portland Cocktail Week Distance Learning. My name is Joanne Street. I'm here with Nickel Axe and Ryan LeClaire, both of Louisville, Kentucky, uh, living not too far from myself as well. How are you guys doing? We're good. We're good. Uh, we do want to start this off by... To anybody who might have concerns, Ryan and I were both, doctor confirmed it, we had coronavirus in February, Joanne can confirm it, it was terrible, <laughs> we're both recovered thankfully, that's why we're not social distancing for this, but I just want everyone to know that we are responsible, we do stay home, we've just both been sick together already. <laughs> that being said. Very fair point. <laughs> uh, hey man, that's how everything's got to start these days, we got to be responsible. Uh, yeah. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I am a portfolio ambassador for Wild Turkey um, and also Campari America. Um, you guys might have heard a few of my colleagues talk over the past few weeks. I'm really excited to get to talk to you two gentlemen today um, because we have got to hang out quite a bit. You guys just opened an awesome new place in Louisville, Kentucky that um, has become one of my favorites. So I'll let you guys chat a little bit. Tell us a little bit about yourselves, um, where you're from, when you guys came to Louisville, um, and so forth. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Ryan, you want to start? Sure. Um, I'm from Minnesota. I grew up there for most of my life, and then I moved to L.A. Uh, shortly after an event with a friend that I met there, and we opened some bars in L.A., and then I went from San Francisco to there for a while. And then at some point, I had reached out to Nicole and Lindsay because they were opening a bar, and it was like, you know, Louisville's starting to feel more and more like home every year I go there, so... And it's, it would be a nice change of pace from San Francisco because everything there is so expensive. So I just, <laughs> I just wanted something different. And I came to Louisville uh, about mid-January is when I got here. And went from right there to opening the bar to... Yeah, yeah. it's been a whirlwind. A couple months of work since you got here, man. <laughs> uh, now a couple months of, more months of that work. Yeah, we've actually, <laughs> this is a sad, funny note, but we've been closed longer than we were open. Uh, I mean, we're going to open again, but, you know, obviously. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Nickel Morris. Um, I've been doing this for a long, long time. I started in Tucson, Arizona, uh, right? Well, it's the most dignified way to say you're old. Uh, I started in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, from there, I bounced around a whole bunch. I spent a lot of time there. Uh, and then I bounced around a bunch between New York, Los Angeles, eventually found my way to Hong Kong, ran a bar there called the Pontiac, which is like a world's 50 best party bar. Started an environmentalists group while I was there. Um, and since then, it's kind of just been pushing further in that direction. I've always been conscious of the environment and also just conscious of costs and all the other things that what we're gonna go over today will make better for your bar. But it was kind of an accumulative thing. And when I got to Hong Kong, you can't, I mean, it's in the headlines a lot today. People see it a lot, but as a beautiful city, it's tarnished by all of the garbage that's wasted by the end of the day. Like when we receive produce in the US, we're very fortunate kind of, and that we get it in big boxes and it comes in a truck and all that stuff. There, that's not really how it works. It comes in a styrofoam container. That styrofoam container is probably going to get thrown out, unfortunately. Like, it's a really ugly system. So it led to a lot of bartenders deciding, well, let's just put our foot down about this. We're at sort of the base. Everything that's made in China comes out of Hong Kong. So we figured if we can start an effort here where a lot of the waste starts, maybe that'll start a chain reaction. And since then, it's just been a big part of my mind. Um, came to Kentucky. When I got back, uh, and uh, Lindsay and I opened Expo, Ryan told me that he uh, was, well, Lindsay told me that Ryan, I'm a motorcycle guy, as you can probably tell by my appearance, uh, and this is my Sunday clothes, and uh, <laughs> she, she told me he was riding his motorcycle across the country, and that was enough for me. I was like, okay, cool, well, we'll hire him, that's, that's good enough for me. And it's turned out okay, he doesn't suck. So it works out, it works out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, so I, I've been around the world a little bit, but I'm very happy to be in Kentucky. That's awesome. And I think that definitely leads into kind of what the seminar today is about. I don't know if you guys um, caught me on Zoom. I guess it was a few weeks ago now, more towards the beginning of quarantine. But Nicol and I actually sat down and talked a little bit about what we call super juice, getting as much as you can out of that citrus without any waste. I mean, that's pretty much what we're going to talk to you guys about today um, is citrus, um, how we can get to that no waste. I know a lot of people um, in the industry are definitely leaning a lot more to sustainability um, and no waste. I've interviewed a lot of bartenders and people in the industry that, that feel that way and are very passionate about that. So I'll let you guys yeah. dive a little bit deeper into um, kind of how you started this program. I know you talked a little bit about how Hong Kong, how you're using it in your, your everyday bar scenario and so forth. 
Yeah, totally. So uh, Super Juice is what we call the final product. The, the process is, uh, we'll get into it, but it's called an oleocitrate, just like an oleosaccharum, but we'll get to that in a moment. Um, it started originally, I used to do keg cocktails. I had like a large program in Tucson and we had, a, ooh, don't knock over the turkey. Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> it's okay, everybody, it's okay. Yeah, let's get it out of here. Let's get it out of here. Let's get it out of Bart's next, I promise you. Uh, yeah, so we had a keg problem in that I was making these carbonated kegs that had that were impossible to filter. So if we put even uh, citrus, if you put citrus juice through it and it's really well sieved, it's still gonna clog it up. So we needed an alternative. I needed something that was water-based. So I started playing with other options and kind of creating fake citrus. And then eventually I came back to making all of that, but just making it from the fruit. Because when I started, fundamentally, if you wanna make this, you could definitely just use like a, an oil, an off the shelf like essential oil, but it's so much, you can't do that every day at your bar program and not every bar can do that. And being in Hong Kong taught me a number of things, but not the least of which is your bar is not guaranteed to have storage. It's not guaranteed to have refrigeration. It's not even guaranteed to have a door. So all of those things teach you a little bit differently how to handle your bar. Pontiac is a metal shoebox in an incredibly humid place. And when we open, you open the whole front of it. So you had to find a way to keep your citrus fresh because that humidity would nuke it right away. Keeping it in bowls was really tough and you don't have refrigeration, so what am I gonna do with this? So you have to find a better way to make the most out of fruit that's already dying. And I think the most, I think the, the standard for that to most people is making a citrus stock after the fact. So like you would, here we have some lemons that Ryan's already started peeling. We're gonna go through this process, but the first step is peel your fruit. Uh, so Ryan has started peeling these fruits. Um, these peels are gonna be significantly more bountiful than you assume they would be. Um, and it makes for a really nice product, but there's a lot of different ways to do it. And the one that I'm going to go over today is the one that I've been working on for years. So this is sort of like the fun. You can do this a lot of different ways. And there's a lot of enthusiastic minds. Um, and I think the coolest way is to sort of focus on a thing, see if it works. So we've been focusing on the citrus and we've been using it at the bar as a way to not only maximize uh, profits, make things stretch longer, but make a fresher, better product. Uh, it's easy to be like, oh, well, this is like an okay stopgap because I'm doing it for the environment. But what if we could do it for the environment and also have a better product because of it? So I wanted to focus on that and that's what this is. Um, Ryan is honestly kind of responsible for the final thing. I've worked on it for years and years and years. And one, oh, we got this pretty funny. Yeah, and one of the issues, uh, one of the issues that you run into is uh, spoilage. That's a huge issue. Obviously, citrus will go in about 48 hours. So we would combine a, a, an assim an approximation of what we're gonna to make today without any plant matter in it and our juice. It was a really nice thing, but as Ryan pointed out, when you clarify your juice, whether it's through uh, uh, any means, whatever means you choose to clarify it, it loses its texture. Because when we look at citrus, the reason it's opaque is because there's still pulp in there. Well, not pulp, actually, as I learned, that's not called pulp. Uh, <laughs> we don't even know, I've been wrong about all this stuff. Anyway, there's... <laughs> Confidence. Organic matter still in there. Yeah, there's, 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 there's still organic matter from yeah. yeah, it's more or less what I'm getting at. Um, so it, it creates a texture. There's a specific texture that comes with that that water doesn't have. It's too thin. So if it's water-based, if it's a stock, if it's something like that, you need to reincorporate plant matter or you won't have the right texture for your citrus. That took us a long time. The way that we make this is we make this oleocitrate and like an oleosaccharum, we leave it for a period of time. I once left it way too long and I couldn't. I used to just rinse the acid off, couldn't get it off. And I was like, Ryan, I'm not really sure what I'm going to do. But the peels had gotten so soft that we could eat them um, without them being bitter, without them being anything, just from the acid. I think we call it a sloosh at that point. Yeah, and we <laughs> refer to it as slime sometimes. Uh, and we took that and we blended it up into kind of this milky thing. And it turns out that's where the texture is. That's where it's all at. You can loosh the oil, which is the process of releasing the oil into the water and causing them to mix. That's what happens when it becomes milky. That's what's happening. So the same thing happens with this oil. And we realized that that plus the little bit of plant matter that's present in the flavetto or the peel on the outside of a lemon was enough to get that texture back into it. Um, Ryan, would you like to talk about the first steps of this? Absolutely. Thank so you. first, obviously, we'll just talk about you peel your citrus. You weigh it out. Um, we have six of them. Uh, I believe this was how many grams of it? Uh, six comes, the, it's tough. So the fruit, the, the Oh, grams, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Ignore that. Um, yeah. This part, the, the weight of the peel is like variable. That's the one part that's kind of a variable that doesn't yeah. need to be set in stone. Yes. It's just, it's just how much more oil and more oil flavor is going to be in there. Yeah, fruit is, fruit's organic, right? So like as much as we would love to be like, oh, you use 10 grams and 10 grams and well, the, this fruit's going to have more or less than that. Yeah. And I don't want to waste any of it. We don't want to waste any of it. So it 
does fluctuate. That's what he's saying. The, the amount will fluctuate for sure because it's organic matter. And if you're the core tenet of not being wasteful, whether you call it sustainability, low waste, whatever you want to call it, is use everything you already have. If you are making new things, that's good if they're made out of old stuff and you're going to use them. But if you're making new things that are going to sit in your fridge, it's no good. So in this situation, we wanted to make sure that we were using all of the fruits, but no more than was necessary. That's why I put you. Yep. Uh, the thing that actually really matters is what you're using here and how much yield you're going for. These are what's, these are like the variables that relate to each other, the ones that depend on each other that actually have a significant impact. So acid you have present, all we're really doing is just adding more acid of what's present already in citrus. So lemon is heavily citric with a little bit of malic. There's other ones there. We'll talk about them in a little bit though. Right now we're just kind of focusing what's on here. You literally just dump them in there. Yep. So this was eight grams of malic. This was 37 grams of citric. And you just literally just let them sit and this like is, you would with an oil sack. Yep. And this is the peels of six fruit. So six lemons, just take six lemons because it's going to, the juice is going to be a component as well. So when you're making a recipe for this, when you walk in every morning and you, go into prep. Normally when you cut fruit, you mindlessly cut it, juice it, throw it away. Well, because we're not throwing it away anymore and we're going to prep it beforehand, we have to be mindful. So when you come in, you're going to still make your juice, but just know you need to make six to make a liter. Um, I guess I didn't say that at the very beginning. This recipe is definitely for a liter, a yield liter. Um, basically the way that it works out so that you guys can understand it on a, a slightly smaller level. This on average gives about an ounce of juice. One lemon does. Uh, with this system, you get six ounces of juice that has the same acid content, but has that can't be oxidized and has uh, like an oil content that's three to four times more potent than what you'd get with like hand squeezed juice. Um, so, first step, peel the lemons. Second step, weigh out your acids. Yep, third step. Combine them with the peels. They you don't go. sit for a minimum of 30 minutes. Yeah, so uh, with lemon and lime, it varies. Lime is significantly more gentle. We all know that. Limes oxidize much faster. Um, with limes, you want to leave it, we leave it at room temp for, what, no more than two hours usually. Uh, and if it's in, if it's refrigerated, you can leave it for about a day is the longest we've had success with. Um, anything longer than that, and it really, uh, it doesn't get bad, I guess. It just turns into that sort of slime. But with limes, it'll get bad. It'll start to oxidize. You can see it. It's visible. You'll see the browning on the peels, just like you're used to. The reason that doesn't happen with lemons, lemons are just genetically engineered to basically be bulletproof, just like oranges or bananas. Like, they're meant to survive every single kind of anything. So it helps. Also, keep in mind, we didn't include this, but I feel like it's a no-brainer. Wash your fruit before you do this. <laughs> that comes up a lot. That comes up a lot. A lot. There's wax on the outside of that fruit. Wash it. That's uh -huh. why it's never a good idea. And the stuff where it came from. Yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah, who knows what else. Um, but yeah, so next step, if it's lemon, leave it for a couple of hours. If you forget it, like we said, that's how we figured this out. So you'll be okay. Lemons, you can definitely leave and it won't be a problem. They really don't oxidize. Remember that citric acid is a very good preservative. When you want to keep uh, potatoes from browning in water or you want to keep uh, garnish apples. How many of you guys cut garnish apples? throw them in the water at work. What do you put in there? Or what should you put in there? It's a little bit of lemon or lime juice because that acid helps keep it fresh. So it's going to stave off some of that oxidation. So that's when he was talking about the acids that we use. We use citric and we use malic. Citric is the sourness. Malic is that dryness, you know, the tartness, like on your tongue that dries it out with the lemon and lime. That paired with the texture makes for a really, 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 really well-rounded juice, which is harder to say than I thought when I tried it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah you, you end up with a, with a better juice um sorry sorry i got a little all right, so, uh, yeah so go ahead so part of the reason why this works which he pointed out to me the other day that i was kind of curious i'm like so i know why i mean sugar pulls out oils that's in a oil sack but i never look into why so there's got to be some obviously some connection why powdered acid works and powdered sugar works well uh the, the protein that keeps sugar in that form is the same protein that's present in citric malic acid that keeps in the powdered form. That protein is what pulls the oil out of the peel. Yeah, you could use anything. You could use maltodextrin or something if you wanted to. That's something that's put into uh, enzymes or food. Like uh, if you get processed peanut butter, stuff like that, they use it as a thickening agent. Mac and cheese, stuff like that. Maltodextrin would work. A lot of things would work totally. Anything that's stabilized like that would work, which is why this works, yeah. which is pretty cool. And it doesn't melt it because that acid does kind of keep it in place. And when I say melt, I mean oxidize. I know nothing. I and if you can see like in here at all, or you can see it's already starting to like turn into oil up. The powder's already been like touched by something. It's already getting wet. Like yeah. it, it, it's, it's, it's nearly instantaneous. It is. And the easiest way to tell, the way we do it at work, is we look at the bottom. 
And once the bottom is fully saturated, right now it's only saturated about here and here, when the entire thing is saturated, that's when you know you're pretty much good to go and you'll have enough oil. Um, and again, we do that to make sure that you're getting all the oil. The biggest problem that I ran into when I was doing this and trying it was that oil. Oil is the hardest thing. Finding acids is not hard. Uh, oil is the hardest thing, and that's the, the best way we found to do it. The reason that we omit those other acids, to go back to that, uh, so ascorbic is a great acid. It's really just a good preservative, but it's not necessary. Just like sugar is not necessary in citrus, you don't need to add any additional sugar because there's not going to be any bitter flavor here. Uh, so no sugar, no ascorbic, or ascorbic, and no sucanic. Sucanic, sucanic <laughs> is an agent of chaos. Sucanic pretty much only exists to oxidize things. It's the catalyst along with malic and citric that actually allow the oxidization process to be accelerated in fruit. So it's still going to happen, but it does happen slower, which is actually why this has a better shelf life. We all know, like we said, what's this, 48 hours, right? No, give or take. What's it, steel and juice? We, we've taken lemon super juice out of the fridge, what, five, six days later? Yeah. And it tastes like two-day juice. Like, it will oxidize. It absolutely does. There's natural plant matter in it. But so. it breaks down so much slower. I think the more impressive one was the lime. Lime is the one, yeah. to me, you can always taste oxidized first. Oh, because it just, you know, what is it, four hours it takes? Yeah, and yeah. you can start to taste it a little bit. Um, after, when we pull one out after four days... And because we, lo and behold, we're a bar. We forgot about some of the <laughs> Yeah, we're in the back. And we found it. And, forgot uh, the prep item. But hey, it was labeled, so we knew it was four days old. <laughs> so we won that battle. Always labeled and um, We both smelt it and tasted a little bit. Like, yeah, it's like a little oxidized, and it's not bad. And then we, like, we made a daiquiri real quick. Because I'm like, you don't taste oxidation at all in a daiquiri. Like, yeah. It's still a usable juice four days later. I've never had lime juice I wanted to use past 16 hours. Yeah, so, yeah absolutely. Same. Let alone... Same. 196 hours? Yeah, and it yeah. legitimately, we're not blowing smoke here. Legitimately tastes really good. Anybody who knows me knows that I'm very picky. Anybody who knows Ryan knows um, that he's exceptionally picky. Uh, I know where I like. Yeah, <laughs> and the, it, it was a, a very difficult thing to get it to taste exactly right, but it tastes so fresh and it tastes so bright. If you've ever had a hand-squeezed margarita, if you've ever gotten out the sea press and made yourself a marg or anything like that, let's be honest, we all know you don't really taste that much lime unless you do it this way. Because you're not gonna get any of the oil unless you do it this way. I mean, not enough. It's being diluted by the plant matter that's in the citrus, all the things, right? There's not enough. That's why when you make a whiskey sour, you hit the top, right? So it still has that lemon essence. Well, when we're making these drinks, uh, it was I made a clover club uh, and you could taste the citrus. Like you could taste the peel through, through the egg white, through the gin, the through egg sour, you can still the vermouth, citrus, through like, everything. Still it. It's yeah. nuts. Yeah. You normally like, you don't, that flavor isn't nearly as present as you want it to be, as far as I want it to be, because I like very flavorful things. Yeah. Uh, if you ever have any of my drinks, they're always like in your face with a lot of flavor. That's how I enjoy, enjoy things. Can confirm. Um, very heavy salt and pepper user. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, so it's, it needed to be more intense. And I think it's kind of like an open secret that we all know. No matter how fresh your juice is, it still doesn't taste all that good. Well, it tastes good, but it doesn't taste that profound. It doesn't taste that much like what it is. That's a big issue. You know, it kind of tastes, especially when you get down into making drinks with half an ounce of citrus, when you're really dropping down, when you get to half or below, you start to run into some flavor resonance problems because the flavor resonance that you have naturally from lemon or lime juice isn't the same that you probably have from your grenadine or a, whatever syrup or vermouth or whatever that thing might be. It has more flavor oil in it. It just does. It was manufactured to be that way. That's why they did it. It wasn't just wine. They added a bunch of stuff to make it taste that way. So we're doing the same thing, but we wanted to make sure that if we were doing the same thing, we did so in a natural way that you know, not like the natural flavors way. Natural flavors have their, most of them are oil-based, most of them are plastic-based. We wanted it to be truly natural because honestly, this cuts your costs. It cuts, it oh cuts your storage. It cuts your everything to a level that like you can't really argue with it unless you're a Puritan, which is fine. I think that's a fair argument to be like, I like my juice to just come from the fruit. So we wanted to get something that was as close to juice just from the fruit that was also kind of futuristic. Like, yeah, we were just talking before this went on. Like, I was like, I kind of crunched numbers in my head real quick. Like, back when I was in California buying cases of lemon and lime, it would cost me around like $32, $33, which that breaks down to 60 ish cents an ounce, yep. uh, depending on how good the yield was and how big the fruit was, all that fun stuff. <laughs> um, you break this down, um, it's less than a dime an ounce, it's closer to six or seven cents an ounce. Yep. Yeah. Um, yep. So, you do that math, you're saving about 50, 53 cents. Per ounce of liquid, yep. uh, you translate that to bar numbers. Uh, we usually run about 20% cost on drinks, just on average. That's what like your liquor cost is supposed to be around nationally. It's what most people go for. Platonica deal. Best, 
an extra 250 you could take off to out for cheaper drinks if you want, or that's just more profit in your pocket, whatever you want to do with it. Ideally, give it to your bartenders like we do. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it really is. It, 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 Ryan's not joking around. It takes a huge amount of cost off your drinks. Like we sell, we can sell a five or six dollar daiquiri to somebody and still make profit and still make enough profit to pay him and pay everybody else at five dollars, at six dollars. And that's because we're using super juice. And it's, it's what's cool about it is not only do we do that, but in doing so, we're helping the environment. We're limiting our own footprint and we're making a more potent product by using everything that's actually in front of us. We're using it citrus six or seven pounds of lemon limes each a week oh that's my it. god yeah like, like that's that. all we would use a week yeah because uh, like i said you know we're we're gonna make a liter it's gonna be a little over a liter out of six six lemons six fruits uh, a buddy of mine some of you guys might know him he might actually be here owen gibbler uh he has a few programs in nashville and they've been able to go from you know double digit case numbers a week to two four three it really really dramatically changes it and, and that trend was thousands of dollars a quarter not yeah in a year yeah, we, we run our bargain program without a case of lemons. We don't need a case every week. We don't even use a case. We wouldn't use a case in a month. And it's not because we aren't busy. It's because we just, that yeah. six cases. We would have to use six cases. The funny part about that is actually the first week we opened, we bought a case of each. Yep. And before we even got through it, it started to like go bad. Yeah, and we had to, sorry, we had to <laughs> make it into this stuff. Uh, yeah, it's you just, this makes, it completely eliminates a pretty large, factor for a lot of people when you're planning you don't need the refrigeration room anymore you don't need to have a huge storage area where we all know citrus isn't supposed to be sitting you can't leave a, a laminate room temperature longer than a few days it just turns crap you can't peel it anymore the juice loses a lot of its flavor so this allows everything to be very fresh and delivered fresh um i think another cool point about yeah, this too is your prep time is significantly cut down you yeah. save money that way too yeah um we're making a liter. It's going to take us longer than it would take you to juice a liter, but we also get to sit here and let this sit for a while. Yeah, it's, it's, so it's, I can go do other things while I'm doing this. So you can yeah. multitask while you prep. So really, like actual work time of making this is maybe ten minutes. Maybe and I made a liter in ten minutes, and the only thing I have waste is the albedo yes. or the pith, as we call it. Yeah. Um, and you can even use that for other things that we've been looking into. Like he just brought up to me a couple days ago. There's actually a, apparently albedo is a good good source of pectin. Yeah, it's a really good pectin source. Pectin can like gelatinize things or yeah. give you like a different texture so we're gonna try to make liqueurs and cordials yeah. and give it a good mouthfeel yes yeah. it's a really nice way because we make we want to make all our own you know liqueurs we try to make everything in-house that we can so we manage just being in Louisville because we're very close to a lot of really great distillers <coughs> Joanne uh so we <laughs> so we have uh so we have like uh you know we have a an advantage so the pectin helps in that sense but it also one of the things that we'll do with the two is just make a tonic a lot of you make tonic syrup right how many of you are using chinchona bark? Whoever just said yes, please stop using chinchona bark. It's dangerous, and that's not your fault. It just is. Chinchonism is a real thing. I had a I had a, a a bartender once who got it, like legitimately. He actually worked for Lush Life too. He got it. Yeah, it's real. I've seen it. It happens. Um, and it's just avoidable. And chinchona bark has to be shipped, and it's in a plastic bag, and it gets cut down in really unethical fashions. So we just try to avoid using it altogether. And to make tonic otherwise. Is to use pith. That's what he uses our bittering agent because, as we all know, the thing that you're going to lean to in your tonic is going to be citrus anyway. You're going to put citrus in it. Why not just make it out of pith to begin with? But if you, as Ryan was pointing out, if you uh, boil bleep, uh, blanch those, <laughs> boil bleach them. Uh, if you boil, don't. No. Uh, so if you if you boil blanch them, uh, you boil them and then hit them into ice water. If you do that a few times with that uh, Elveto, the pith, the white stuff that'll actually get really soft and really nice and you can turn it into a lot of things. I have a friend that's a chef in LA that turns it into a really lovely dessert. So there's a lot of options. Um, used to triple blanch uh, mandarins and use mandarin puree for a cocktail. That's yeah. San Francisco. It's, yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's a known method in the shop yeah. world for sure. Absolutely, and it's a really good one. It's a very useful one. Um, pith is a thing that gets slept on constantly. We don't use it, we should use it. Uh, it's seen as like this bad entity, but it's really not. You know, we're not afraid of bitterness in this in this industry and. That's all that that really represents. Look at Fernet consumption or Amaro consumption or Bartender. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's wrong with this? You guys can drink all this Campari. You can, you can drink all this Campari, and if you can drink all this Campari, Braulio. Yeah, you can. You can. Yeah. 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 Anyway, so moving on. So now it's sat for not long enough. If you look at it too, like just literally, it's pulling like a slurry in there, and it's like everything's already gone. Yeah. So we just literally can just take this. What's up? Can you actually hold the bottom of that up to the camera so everyone can see a little bit better? The front of y'all's table is actually cut off a little bit. Perfect. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
What part? The, uh, the, yeah, that. This? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Show them so the, the front part of your uh, little bar area is cut off. So if you guys can just hold up things so everyone can see them. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Yeah. Got it. So yeah, this is the slurry. It's already pulled out. Like there's, everything's been touched. I, like you might not be able to see as well as I can, obviously, but everything there has been touched by some kind of oil. Yep. So this is, oh, go ahead. So what we do is we take a little bit of water, we dump it in here just to help all the rest of the solution. We This is pre-measured water, by the way. This was uh, about 700 it's, uh, uh, it's 28 ounces. 28 yeah, ounces, because we're gonna need about another six-ish to make a liter. Yep. Um, so we get all in there, we're gonna dump it in here. So this is kind of like our base solution, just making sure we get all the acid out. And we get a little bit more in here just to make sure we get it all out. That's all of our flavor. And literally, we just dump the rest of that in there. Yep. Perfect. So then, then we have our little solution with our peels. And now we're gonna cut citrus and we're just gonna juice it right in there. Yep. So while he's doing that, I'll talk a little bit about what's happening. So this is what was in that cup that you guys saw the bottom of, that's oleocitrate. That's a term to get very comfortable with. Uh, it is just like oleosaccharum, it's a technique, it's a really good technique. Um, it works fantastically well and that's an easy way to refer to it. We've been calling it slime. That's not the easiest way to sell. Like, hey, here's a new world changing thing you should totally use. What is it? It's slime, you should drink it. Yeah, it's funny to us, but <laughs> so we found a better term for it. We call it oleocitrate. Um, it's it's really cool. And then what he's done, obviously, is he just hydrated that. When you're taking it out, uh, when you're taking the, the citrate out, definitely do it. Ryan did and, and give it a little water to move it around a little bit. So that oil is going to cause it to start getting sticky. Um, it's going to it's gonna want to stay in there. Um, but yeah, and then what we're going to do after this is we're going to bring out our best friend, the immersion blender. Uh, this is, I, actually, I'm going to use this time to, just talk about immersion blender. Um, everybody should have an immersion blender. If you don't have an immersion blender, you're doing it wrong. If you have a regular blender and not an immersion blender, you're doing it wrong. You, a regular blender is an immersion blender that's stuck in a cup. Take it out of the cup, liberate it, free will, <laughs> have your own. And what's really useful about it, all these jokes aside, is when we're juicing, A, incredibly useful. We couldn't make this without, it's, it's requisite. You need some, whether it's a food processor, some sort of blade, because we are gonna macerate all of these peels that are in here now. Um, because they're soft, we don't need to worry about, like we said, bitterness. Um, yeah, this is also really helpful, and we'll see that in a moment when you're straining citrus. If you're running it through um, a fine sieve, like we're all accustomed to one of these, we all know these. Well, if you're running through one of these and it's full, how many of us have sat for 20 minutes during prep and been like, God, I really wish you would be empty so I could wash you and then I could be done? Well, if you take this and you put it in here and you turn it on, It'll cause centrifugal force to shoot all your juice out much faster, so it saves you a little bit of time while you're prepping. Too. Almost it's coming, there. It's coming from a guy who used to prep hundreds of gallons of cocktails while he's driving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, when I was with Roadsoda, we would do, you know, thousands of, of drinks. You know, the regular weekend was sixty to 80,000 drinks, uh, and we would make them usually when we were driving down the road. It's the easiest way to do it. you got to find convenient ways to do everything. And we had a pressurized filtration system for citrus and stuff. It was definitely like, there are shortcuts you can take. All right, you ready? And then, yeah, like Ryan sort of pointed out earlier, take the, that, uh, take the, the leftover fruits, the husks, set them aside for whatever you want. Now, you can compost those. Like we said, you can boil blanch them. You can make tonic out of them, which is what I would do with them. It is what I do with them. But it's entirely up to you. The neat thing about what we're doing and the greater discourse about it is that Ryan and I have figured out one part of a much greater story. This is kind of like one step. So it's really fun, but I encourage everyone to take this and try it on their own. Try your own thing. See if you do. I have had friends that have tried a lot of really cool things, and they've come up with some really neat additions for their location in terms of what this is. I designed it as like a catch-all. It's sort of modular. It's supposed to be a way to fix your citrus, to make your citrus a closed system so that you don't have to think about it in the same way anymore. But it is really useful We when it's left over. So it does still go bad. It does still absolutely go bad. It goes slower. Um, but it does go bad. And when it does, we can use it for other things. At that point, I would definitely compel you to clarify it and use it as a base for a falernum or something along those lines. Uh, make a liqueur out of it. Make a curacao. Make a whatever. But wait until it's actually dead. Wait until it's truly and honestly dead. Uh, because clarifying juice like we said before, just takes all of the good texture out of it. So if you do that beforehand, you end up with that lesser texture. It's part of the reason that having a little bit of the fresh juice in here is really nice. Uh, you wanna blend? Yeah, Shall we absolutely. blend? Yep. And nice. the other, another point to that too is like, I know some bartenders out there, myself included, we would just take our old citrus and use it to make um, a punch. Yep. 
So you can still use this. It has all the acid content you need because citric acid is what curdles whey. Yep. So whey creates that clarification vessel. So it's another thing you can do as well. Yeah, and if you were to use like oxidized lime and you were doing a lot of pineapple or something, that would yeah. taste really nice because they oxidize in the same way. What we've also discovered is coconut milk does the same thing. It yes. creates that coagulation. So if you want to do vegan milk punch, yep. um, you can use coconut milk. Yeah, we, uh, everything at Expo is, it's not, it's as vegan and as hypoallergenic that was as friendly as we can be. Yeah, as we can be. Uh, most of it is like we try not to keep a lot of the stuff we don't need to have around, and we try to just sort of look at the future. But not the blend. So immersion blender, stick blender. As you can see, it's starting to loose. See how much yellow bake it is. The thing to note too about immersion blenders uh, for lime, get a good one. Yes. I, how many did I break? Three. Uh, this, this is the third one. We broke two. Yeah. Um, get a good one that's actually got some power to it. Because yeah. lime yeah. is uh, lime is not as cooperative as lemon. No. Uh, the peels. Yeah, that is a really good one, Ryan. There's um, these these work great. This is just a chef brand. You can get a depot or whatever. Um, great immersion blender. Anything that's like a decent half horsepower or higher will work really well. Stay away from the KitchenAid ones, only because as we learned, they break in half when you do this with them. Uh, <laughs> The red ones and the blue ones both do it, just in case you were wondering. Um, I don't know if they're broken out because of it, but that did happen somehow. <laughs> I'm not talking about that part. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, but he's right. It, they will, because the peels, once they start to get soft, well, actually, they get so soft that they can wrap around that blade, and it sort of screws everything up. So it really helps if you just have a big chopper. Now, a food processor would work great for this, too. We just don't have a food processor in our Mies. So this is based on the Mies of Expo. If you had that, if you had that in your regular prep, I would encourage you to use it. Absolutely, a food processor would do a great job of this. That being said, like I said, my favorite is the immersion blender. I think it'll work best. It's in our mise en place. We have a very minimal mise en place. Yes. This is the easiest way to have it. I just, I just realized this is literally pretty much our mise en place. Yeah, I brought the whole bar bump. Minus our, uh, <laughs> our centrifuge juicer that we use for like ginger and all this yeah. stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, we have a centrifugal juicer, you know? Like, um, this is literally like, this is all we got for a bar. Because yeah, it's all we need. Uh, we have a, what do we have? We have, um, you know, we have a, an immersion circulator too. That's it. You just don't really need more than that. But yeah, so this is this is our finished juice. Um, you can, oh yeah, we'll put it in this little pitcher. Strain. And just to show you guys, so these are, let me see if I can get those on camera. If you guys can see that kind of. So that's the sort of lemon meal that's done. That's what's left when you're done. It's really good. It's not bitter at all. You can eat it. Like, I mean, you could candy it if you want to. Oh, yeah. We've talked about it a bunch. We could totally candy it. It would be really nice. It doesn't taste bad at all. We don't. I mean, we're very fortunate that it doesn't taste bad. I'm super surprised that science is on our side there. Um, but it tastes really nice. The juice is really nice. You end up with a really potent, really bright product. Yeah? Yeah. It's been a minute since I've made that and tasted it. Oh, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, yeah, so that's the give and take of oleocitrate um, and super juice. Uh, questions, do we have questions? Joanne, do we have questions? Yeah, absolutely, so the first one I have for you is how much citric acid for a batch? Okay, so for a one liter batch? Of lemon. Of lemon, that's the six fruit batch, that's what we're making, well, that was, yeah, that's what we made today. So that is uh, 37 grams. It is 44 grams per liter. So say you wanted to make a liter of this juice with no lemon juice that you were going to introduce. Just all on its own, just oleocitrate. That's all you were making. Well, if you were going to do that, it's as simple as 10 to 1 by weight, gram weight. So it would be, you know, it's, it's um, 44 out, or I misspoke. 44 grams of citric, 10 grams of malic, and that's plenty for one full liter of oleocitrate on its own. Okay, and then your next question is, could you dehydrate the lemon peels, then rehydrate, then in a bit of water, then add the acids? Yeah, but there's no reason to do that. It's, um, it's, it's extra work. Yeah, and it's extra energy. Uh, dehydrating stuff either takes a lot of time or a lot of energy. It's calorically heavy either way. So uh, you could do that. Um, I would advise against it for two reasons. One, the oil you want to taste fresh. Um, we actually have some, I have some dehydrated lime peels over here on my desk from a different video and uh you can smell it you can taste it you can apply it it's just not the same as fresh feel um it's not nearly as buoyant it doesn't froth nearly as well that's fragrant no it's not nearly as fragrant this was useful and it's useful in gins and stuff 
um, in a time, you know, this is, this is sort of a period correct way to infuse. But in the modern age, we do it this way. To be honest, I didn't even used to do it this way. I used to wash it off. I would put it on, let it take it off. And out of fear that it was going to get bitter, I would wash it off. Almost got you, Bart. But <laughs> we're going to come over there. But uh, what we realized, obviously, as we explained, was that's not the case. And as I just ate, that's not the case. They actually turn out really nice. So, yes, you could do that, but I would advise against it. Um, it I would love, whoever asked that question, I would love for you to try it. And I would love to try it. And I'd love to see if it's any different because maybe, maybe, but my immediate scientific instincts tell me that there would be no desire to do that or reason to do that. There's not really like, yeah, there's not even like a preservative advantage there either because you're dehydrating, rehydrating, you're losing flavor, you're losing quality, you're losing, and it's, it's the preservation of like dehydrated appeal doesn't really do much for me personally. Like the only time I've ever wanted a dehydrated appeal is when I'm, trying to infuse it into an atmosphere sure sure um even then though like peels are pretty resilient minus lime lime is not as nearly resilient yeah. where you can peel them and sit for a day with the wet paper towel sometimes but this process is just so simple like i don't i don't see a real need to as yeah as i'm trying to say i guess yeah and the uh, one thing to keep in mind uh, the only final thing i'll say is um, the thing to keep in mind with this process is that it's meant to be something you can show up to work and do every day now this is a thing you can do with fresh fruit in the amount of time that it took us to do, well, significantly less than the yeah. amount of time that it usually takes us. So, you know, it's, you could, but that sounds like it would add days and days when it comes to citrus, to me sounds scary. Because days- And then you have to buy a dehydrator and have a dehydrator and then- What do you say? I mean this with all endearment, I don't mean to like talk bad about people, but I don't like dehydrated garnishes. It makes me feel like I'm at a chip factory. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it's, it's, you're not adding anything to the drink. You're not adding any flavor. You're actually wasting the whole fruit. So I just don't understand the point of it. Yeah, in general, like dehydrating your garnish, on that note, just because it's something we can chime in on, we actually don't dehydrate our garnish either. And the reason that we don't do that is because our fruit is for eating, mostly. Um, if you do that, I know that the argument is that, well, we'll, we'll use less fruit. And that, mm, uh, that's only kind of true, because you bought this fruit 200 at a time in a case. Um, and if you waste two at the end of a night on par, not a great thing, but would take you 100 days to waste an entire case. So while I understand that argument, I think it's a little bit short-sighted. So rather we don't dehydrate at all. Like I said, try not to make new things so much as most of things. So I like that idea and I definitely like the spirit, but I think that it might get in the way. And yeah, you just created an extra use for citrus while you're using more essentially, yeah. What's next, Joanne? Next you've got, can you use this process on other fruits? Yeah, well, so we have used it on other citrus. I've definitely used it on other citrus. I cannot say I've used it on other fruit. fruit. Pineapple's a thing that I fight with all the time. I think it's a thing that when it comes to like making the most of, we all fight with all the time. I know people love to say tapache and stuff. I lived in Tucson, Arizona for a long, long time. Tapache is delicious, but let's be honest, it's not light beer. It's not something we can serve everybody. It's not even a pineapple daiquiri, which we can serve more people. So that being said, um, Pineapple would probably be a cool place to experiment. Um, I historically really don't like pineapple syrup because it only exists as a way to flex. It was never really about flavor. It was just about showing you could afford to put a pineapple in there because you can't scientifically get better pineapple flavor out of the fruit without distillation. So like if you infused it, it would get weaker without question. It just would because it's a juice to begin with. That being said, orange and grapefruit, I don't do because I don't have a reason to. Oranges are already enough of a problem for all of us, let's be honest. <laughs> oranges are an issue. So oranges, we don't do it with. Um, we could, because we could acid adjust it and a whole bunch of things. I think that kind of gets away from things a little bit. So for our program, no, but for your program, absolutely. And what I will say is that I've experimented with other citrus to success. Ryan's played with bananas a little bit to some success, um, but we would be open to, if somebody has a question or they want to work on a thing and they want to, you know, E email me or something like that. If you're working on a cool thing and you want to try it out and you want some information or maybe I can help, shoot me an email or something. I'll do my best. And so, grapefruit already has a two to three day shelf life, so there's really no need to. Yeah, well, and grapefruit, you know, like, grapefruit, yeah. we all use grapefruit juice, but like the great grapefruit conspiracy is that we can't even get white grapefruits anymore, which means that we get ruby reds, so they're not as good anyway. We're just in this like terrible position <laughs> with grapefruits. Uh, I'm sorry to all those Texans that love your ruby red. They're fantastic, they're delicious white grapefruits are better um <laughs> they are they're drier they taste better they're more bitter um next, next question next question <laughs> before we get too off topic there um, eh, it's sort of impossible for us 
Um, how would you change the citric or malic ratios to super the various types of citrus? Uh, so for lime, we just go heavier malic. Yeah, that well, ratio is well, well malic's about the same. Malic's pretty much the same, but citric's a little higher. So with That's lime, nice. lime's a lot closer. We operate, listen, fruit fluctuates, ripeness fluctuates. And we as human beings have the tools to look really close at things. But sometimes it's like looking at an elephant's nose. You got to back up a little bit. So I think that you definitely can. They can be very specific. I can tell you right now that according to <laughs> the FDA's mass spec, there's 44.7 grams of citric acid in a liter of lemon juice. There are 43 grams of citric acid in a liter of lime juice. That's the big difference. So because it's two grams over the course of a liter, and we're talking about fresh fruit, and we're talking about mixing, and we're talking about a lot of other things. Also the oils and the peels, we're adding a lot of different flavor, and it's, it's hard to notice. So we, the reason that we didn't fluctuate it, that is the difference. There is absolutely a difference. I'm not gonna say that there isn't. There absolutely is. There are more, there's actually more citric acid in raspberries, in case you're wondering. But the important thing here, again, the acids are a, a big part of this, but it's just, I, I don't know. What do you think, Ryan? I think it's don't get so hung up on what acid is present in what. Obviously, we all know lime is traditionally a little bit sharper than lemon. As long as they taste like that, I think that's all you need to worry about at the end of the day. Yeah. Especially because you're getting all you're, you're still using the juice. You still have that juice in there. You still have the peel from the oil. So you can still we we don't some days we don't label our juices, and you can sit there and you can you smell it, and you know the oh you can see it. it. You can see it. You can smell I mean, it. Like this is this is great. This is almost the color the juice comes out. The juice comes out like a crazy green. You've been in our bar color. and you've had yeah. our citrus drinks, and you know when it's lime. You know when it's lime. You can tell. It's, so we, we definitely, I think that, I see it as a, uh, I think it's a very fair question. I think that you can choose which way you, you want to do it. We assimilate, but that's because for the sake of teaching this to people, for this, like, I'm the only person out here teaching people this stuff. So it makes it a little easier for me to be able to show Ryan and show everybody so they can learn it. That being said, yeah, there is a slight difference. And if that's what you would like to observe in the way that you manufacture your oleocitrate, please, by all means, do observe that. Uh, we have chosen against it because it's two grams and because on the grand scheme of things, after having done this for years and years, I can tell you, in my personal opinion, I don't think it makes a tremendous difference. But objectively, if we want to look very close at it, yes, there is a difference. It looks That's like a great I question. All these have been really good questions, by the way. You guys have done a really great job, I think, of getting into detail and explaining this process. I don't see any more questions right now. We'll give it another minute or so before it goes through, but I can definitely attest to to the juice that comes out of uh, what you guys are doing. It's refreshing, it's delicious. You can always tell it is a little bit different than that, that standard squeezed lemon or lime. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot more flavorful. I mean, objectively, it's significantly more so. The way that I explain it is, you know, if you gotta make a whiskey sour, we like to hit it with a, a single lemon peel, right? That's a single flavetta, as I've learned it's called, uh, a single one of those. Well, if we do that by weight or however you wanna think about it, there is, by weight, including the ends, six to eight of those on each fruit. So if we're talking about an ounce and we're putting all of that oil in here, it's too much. So we disseminate it a little bit and you end up with this really nice product. You could make it more potent is what I'm saying. If you really wanted to, you could make it a little bit more potent. The number I've chosen, I've chosen just on tasting it. And it's more than you need, but that's what makes it super. It's called super juice. I'm not calling it juice. So it needs to be a little bit more flavorful. Uh, and that's, you know, we all want hand squeeze. We want hand squeeze and we want it as quick as possible. We want it as safe as possible, as ethical as possible, as everything as possible, right? Well, that's what we're aiming for. I don't got to invest in a big juicer anyways. Like, yeah, yeah. like even those overhead squeezes, the level squeeze, a lot of us use the big one yeah. the presses, they'll still cost 70 bucks for a decent one. Yeah. And they'll yeah. still break after six months. And how dirty do they get? You know, when you're cleaning them, like one of the problems with the squeeze juicer is I challenge every person, every bartender who's at home right now that has a C press specifically, flip it open. How dirty is it? Because my guess is that in here, there's a dirty. bunch of crap. And that's oil. That's what you want in your juice. That's not the best way to get it. Just mine's, feel it. Mine's dirty. Yeah, everybody's <laughs> is. Of course they are. If you use it at all, it gets that way because that's where the oil ends up. And if you don't wash your fruit, that's where the wax ends up. But even this one, you know, we've used it a little bit and there's still some here. And that's because that's what happens. So these are great, but don't assume that that oil is going into your juice just because you're squeezing it out. You're putting it onto a painted metal plate. It's gonna stick, it's gonna stick, and it's gonna stay there. So we've tried to find a way to remove it directly without, a dis without distilling it, without doing anything that's crazy expensive or super difficult to do. Like Ryan said, I used to work for a company that did really big events in the middle of fields uh, in the easiest 
you know, there was no easy way to do any of that. So we found the best way to do all of it. Um, and that's kind of the same idea that we're bringing to citrus now. Um, this is what we think is the best way to prepare citrus. And then I think two really cool points I always like to bring about this is, one is we're not creating a new product, we're, we're improving upon an old. Yep. We're not giving you something new you have to figure out how to use. This is something we everyone uses in their programs. This is something my dive bar I first started out with use. <laughs> yeah. When we used to have roses cordial on the, on the well and we ran out and we had to go juice some limes to make roses lime juice because, uh, Getting that regular's name. <laughs> it's okay. They won't hold you to it. Because uh, she had, she always had to have a roses uh, gimlet with a beef feeder every day. Yeah, uh, it's like we had to go juice it, and make it fresh. And I would actually argue like any any bar could use this, and yeah. they would use it. Yeah, I would argue that this is maybe closer to how you juice in a dive than how you juice it, say like EMP. You know, like I think this is probably closer to how you juice because it's it's a lot more similar. It's you know, it's by by the by, you kind of all in minute. You know, you do it as you go, but. Six for a whole day for a whole dang liter is pretty nice. So and it doesn't take longer. Yeah, it's a uh, we we keep saying this stuff, but it I can't emphasize it enough, which is why I continue to. It's it's cool stuff, man. And then the other thing I was talking about too is like the flavor. Like some of you are familiar with the term. Some of you know by different names, but regaling appeal in a drink. Uh, it's something to add more brightness, more oil into a drink. We're literally putting instead of one peel like anywhere from four to eight peels per drink depending on how much lime or lemon juice you use. How many it just adds so much more flavor. How many of the bartenders watching when they were starting out were like, oh, what if I put a peel and I shook it in there? Or what if I put it in the glass and then I stirred it? Well, you'd be right. That was the better thing to do. It that's the better the choice. Yeah, it, absolutely. And that's because your juice doesn't really have it. It lacks it. That's why you can put a lemon peel and shake with it and be like, oh man, this tastes so bright and nice. Yeah, of course it does. Because the juice you had before, even though you think it's the best juice, just like we did, because we started at the same time, and anything that wasn't sour mix was the freshest, best possible juice. Not necessarily the case. And with this, we end up with something that is a little bit better, which is cool, because it doesn't, it's no harder to make. You can make this in the middle of the jungle. You can make it camping. You can make it at events. Like, it's incredibly useful for parties, because you have to have six lemons to have a liter of lemon juice for cocktails, for punch, or whatever. You don't need to have... It's oleocitrate. It's like oleosaccharum. It's, you don't need a lot of it. It's about stretching. And then like you saw us do, you can just get started. Let's sit. And you can sit there and chat with a friend, bullshit, drink beer, whatever yeah. you want to do. <laughs> Receive yeah. orders is usually what I do. Yeah. <laughs> or when I was at the bar, I would get the chat. Sorry? I said I like Ryan's idea a lot better. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> some of us have to work for a girl. When I was working, <laughs> when I was working, I would just do the other prep. Then I would get this started, and I would juice some ginger, mix some passion fruit That's syrup, true. whatever had to be done. When I say some has to work, I just mean him. He's the one who does all the work. I don't do anything. Well, I, mean, <laughs> I could listen to you guys all day talk about this. I know, Nickel, we've had the opportunity to sit down. And, I mean, your brain is always running and kind of what can be the next sustainable thing or how can I make something super simple and expand it a little bit more. So I always love listening to you guys. Talk. Good, good, good. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out on social media. Uh, these yep. guys are professionals, the nerds behind this super juice, as we would call it. It's not normal juice. Um, super. Super. Um, I'm Joanne Street, Nicole Morris, Ryan LeClaire. It's always good to see you guys. Hopefully, we can hang out in person soon. Um, hopefully, fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah, we need our peanut gallon at the bar back. Yeah, fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> Bring Caleb. Yes, definitely. <laughs> well, then Bruce is coming with Caleb. Comes. <laughs> Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. Good afternoon.